Jordan Wiley on the Leader Connect podcast. This is really exciting. Um, good morning, Jordan. How are you? I am very well, thank you, and a privilege to be here. <laughs> well, well, thank you for saying that because it feels like a real privilege for me as well. Now, what I, I think a lot of people probably know who you are and what you've done, but I always get people to do this in 60 seconds. And I've given you slightly longer because you've achieved quite a lot in your life. Um, in 60 seconds, can you run down your life from the start to where you are now? God, that's pressure, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm feeling the Leader Connect vibe already. Um, I think, oh, where do I start? Oh, back in Blackpool. I'm a, I'm a Blackpool lad, Lancashire lad. Um, I'm running out of seconds already. I left school at 16, no qualifications. Um, not very proud of that at all. And joined the British Army. Um, one of the best decisions I ever made. I spent 10 years in the British Army. I left the British Army in late 2009. Um, I spent the next five years working... Uh, in the private security sector, uh, defending ships from pirates, uh, effectively. And then for the last six or seven years, I've been a full-time adventurer, um, trying to make a living out of doing weird and wonderful adventures around the world. And then coming back to the UK and sharing the lessons, writing about them, talking about them, and somehow trying to forge a living out of doing that. Um, I also work on TV, um, do quite a bit with uh, Sky News as a commentator on, on different issues and also work on Channel 4's Hunted as one of the ground hunters. Um, yeah, and, that, and that's me. And I've obviously been on lots of emotional, personal journeys along the way that we all go through, whether it be relationships, whether it be business, love, life and everything in between. And I guess, you know, th th they're the things that have forged me to who I am today and where I am, I guess. So, so what I want to do is I, I want to kind of unpick you a little bit. And that sounds, um, don't, don't be scared by that. But what, what I mean is to try and understand um, why you have made some of the choices that you've made and how you, well, you're leading what I would say is a, a life that's very, very definitely less ordinary. Um, and I want to kind of understand what pushes you to do some of those things, some of the amazing things that you've done. Um, and, and then also those times where you found life to be just a little bit challenging how you've kind of pushed yourself through through those because we've all come out of this this really difficult two years and goodness knows at the moment we've now gone into a really difficult stage again with with Ukraine etc cetera, etc cetera. um and and I think that we all kind of have gone through a phase over the last couple of years of trying to push ourselves out of um probably um a pretty deep dark black hole as a world so I'd like to kind of talk about that but the first thing I want to ask you was um we talk about in Leader Connect about having a very clear and compelling purpose for everything that you do. And I genuinely believe that that is the secret to pretty much everything we do. If we know the direction in which we're traveling um, and we understand why we're doing it, then life just becomes that much easier. Now, you have a very clear and compelling purpose. Can you tell us what it is? Yeah, so I, I try to live by... I guess the mantra of, of be the difference that makes a difference. And it, for me, it's about trying to have a positive impact, uh, especially on the next generation. Um, you know, again, very proud, privileged, honored to be the national ambassador for the army cadet force, which is a, a great passion of, of both of ours. And, you know, I, whether, whether I'm helping children in the UK as part of the cadet force, whether I'm in schools trying to, trying to do my best to inspire um, the next generation, or whether I'm at the other side of the world, you know, trying to help build a school or provide some textbooks or help some teachers with funding, um, you know, to, to, to again try and inspire. Because one thing I have learned in life is, as I said, I guess in my introduction, I left school with no qualifications and and and, and again, not, not proud of that at all, because one thing I did have, which I didn't really understand till later, was the opportunity to go to school. And I guess being a soldier and also having traveled to lots of hostile, extreme, remote locations, you, you, you start to learn as you go through life that not everyone has the opportunities that I took for granted. And actually, not everybody has the opportunities that a lot of us take for granted. And and it's very easy when you're when you're sat in the UK or or sat at home in your you know your nice warm house with your three meals a day and your family around you. But when you go to these weird and wonderful places that are often very dangerous and and challenging, you, you see the world in a different light. Uh, it, as you mentioned, the Ukraine now, you know, children are fleeing their homes, and and that's their normal everyday sort of existence. Whereas 
a lot of things that we have and, 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 and the perks and the pros that we have in our life here, we, we take for granted. And, and I, don't, I don't, not because we're bad people, but because we haven't seen anything else. And I think one of the great things about traveling through adventure or as a, as a, as a service person is, is you, you, you get to see the world firsthand. And that, that isn't always, doesn't always mean you're seeing great things. You often see some pretty terrible things, but it gives you an appreciation for your own life. And it allows you to process your own journey, I think, in more detail. Um, and for me, it always stuck with me that, that, that the children I met, you know, I was always able to process as a soldier in places like Iraq that, you know, dangerous things happen, bad things happen. And, you know, ultimately people will pay the ultimate sacrifice. And that is unfortunately part and parcel of, of, of military life uh, in, in any military service around the world. And I was always able to understand that and process that. But what I failed or, or struggled to understand was the children that I, I, I sort of came across and interacted with because they had not chosen those lives. I'd chosen to be a soldier. My colleagues had chosen to be soldiers. But the children that I met, they, they were a victim of, I guess, the lottery of life and a victim of circumstances that they found themselves in. And they could not really do anything about that. And the one thing that I learned on that sort of journey that's still ongoing for me is that education was the one thing that I took for granted is one of the most important things when you don't have that much to live for on the face of it because it inspires hope it inspires hope for a better future and if you've got hope you know you've still got life and I, I, I saw the first hand impact of that in in places like Iraq Afghanistan Syria Somalia Africa and I think that if you can make a difference in any way, then you absolutely should, especially if it's to the next generation, because they're the future. Um, and, and we have to do our best in a very challenging and a very difficult world to try and inspire them and provide them with opportunities, I believe. Because, you know, people did that for me. I, I, I was on a, on a pretty treacherous route myself, I guess, you know, whether it be at 14, 15, you know, drugs, crime, um, whatever it might be, getting or hanging around with the wrong people. And sometimes you just need a little bit of a nudge on the right path and you just need a little opportunity to open your eyes to, to an, another world. And, and, and I was very fortunate to have that. So for me, I always think you should pay it forward in life. You know, people have looked out for me, they've given me opportunities. And I think we have a, a responsibility, a duty as humans to, to do that and pay it forward for others. So, so on that note, um, I just wanted to kind of touch on sort of decision making because you you mentioned there about um, you know there being various points where you I suppose could have gone down one route um, or or another route, and I can see this um, having just read your book, The Power of Paddle, about the. Um, the times when things have got really, really difficult and you can make a decision to go one way or the other way. How do you make decisions? Um, you know, how do those things come about? Because I think if there's one thing that people really, really struggle with, particularly in leadership, um, is making decisions and then having made a decision and maybe regretted it or worst case scenario, not making any decisions at all because they're too scared to make them. So how do you make your decisions? No, it's a great question. And it's a fascinating subject as well because I, I think like like everyone I'm, I'm constantly learning all the time and I, you know I, I've made lots of bad decisions in my life I've, I'm certainly not one of these people who says I, I have no regrets I live my best life you know I've, I've got lots of regrets and if I if I had the opportunity I would do things different but of course we can't control the past but we, we can only learn from it and for me it's about continuing to learn it's about you know everything that we do in our life guides us to where we are today and 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 you know I, I had a lot of in in the last sort of six or seven years certainly a lot of depression anxiety around decisions that I got wrong you know and, and a lot of them aren't necessarily to do with my professional life a lot of them are pr probably more personal you know things like relationships breaking down things like making promises that I wasn't keeping um you know I, I promising to spend more time at home with the family and even though I had the best of intentions of doing that, just just didn't take follow through with the action. And um, I, you know, you, you know, decision making is is a really tough thing. And especially, uh, you know, whether as a soldier or as an adventurer, we make quite extreme decisions sometimes. And I think the key to good decision making, I think, is knowing when to make the decision. It's not necessarily the decision itself. I think it's about when you make that decision because. You know, certainly in some of the, the, the situations I've been on the more extreme side, it's, 
you, you know, we, we, we talk about often in the military that sort of pause and reflect condo moment. And, and that's, that's really important to, to consider because, you know, if you make a decision too slowly, I found that events overtake you and you, and you, you lose control of whatever the situation is. And, you, and then on, on the contrary, contrary to that, you know, if you make decisions too quickly, and the reason I've made decisions too quickly in the past is because I, I, I involve my emotions and, and I don't think that's ever a good thing. And again, I'm, not, I'm only speaking on behalf of my own experience, you know, different, I guess, leaders uh, would have different opinions. But for me, when you bring emotions into decision making and, and it overtakes the logic, that can become quite dangerous, especially in extreme environments. Um, you know, I, I really try to dis disconnect my em emotional sort of state to, to the, the decision that needs to be made um, in, in the environment I'm in. And, you know, if you make decisions too quickly, you, you start to act rashly. You don't process what needs to be done. And then, as you say, on the again, from another perspective, it, it, you know, it, sometimes we find with 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 good leaders, experienced leaders that they don't make any decision at all, which is a decision in itself not to act. And, you know, and. So for me, I, I, I don't have any secret recipe. I'm, I'm certainly a long way from perfect and I've made lots of bad decisions, but, but I think it all comes down to learning. It all comes down to life experience and learning. And, 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 I, I, and I, I still don't get things right today, but I think you have to be open to learning because a lot of people, you know, a lot of leaders, in fact, who, I, who I've certainly worked under and for, they, they, they don't want to learn because they think they know better often. So you know, you have to be open to learning because if, if you're not, you, you you will never grow and develop as a leader. Um, and, and you will also, you know, some of the best lessons we learn in life, are, 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 you know, it's not, it's not a cliche and we hear it a lot are from the mistakes we've made. Um, and you have a choice to either dwell on that, uh, you know, which often causes depression or you think too far into the future about a decision that's coming, which causes anxiety. And for me, I often try to, 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 to not live in the past, but also not live too far in the future. I try to live as much in the moment. And, you know, I think you call it mindfulness and things like that these days, but I, I try to, I try to live in the here and now and, and control the controllables and, and do what I can to, um, you know, to find the best solution. And do you know what? Isn't isn't that so true? Because the only thing that we can control is what happens right now. What's gone before has has gone. It doesn't exist anymore. And what happens going forwards doesn't exist either because well, because it doesn't because it's not happened yet. So so the only thing that's real is here and now. And, and I try to do exactly the same. You know, I, I think it is very difficult not to worry about things happening in the future and clearly we need to make plans um you know plans for retirement plans for this what happens if all of those kind of things but actually the only thing that's real is right here and right now and I think the more people that remember that I think the more people will start to find um life just just that much easier and um, so what I wanted to ask you about was something that that happens to an awful lot of leaders and I've got to be honest and I'm saying this because I am a woman I think it's it's very prevalent particularly in female female leaders as well is this sense of imposter syndrome of this sense of you know how many people actually fear calling themselves a leader I hear that all the time when I'm talking to people when I'm coaching people it's this this I can't even call myself a, a leader because I don't believe that I am and and I always say to them well well when are you going to be a leader what 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 is it that's going to happen to to make you kind of change your mindset and and say that you are a leader and often it, it, there isn't anything it's just this sense of imposter syndrome now you kind of um um, refer to yourself as an adventurer, which which absolutely 100% you are. But I wonder if you ever have those times where you sit there and go, I don't really believe this. I don't really believe that that, that I am who I am. Um, and do you ever have that sense of imposter syndrome? Oh, absolutely. Um, especially, as you say, when it comes to leadership, you know, I, I think when you, you know, I, I came... I came from a, a, a quite a humble background, but also even my career in the military, you know, I was a, I was a junior non-commissioned officer. I was a long way down the pecking order in terms of leadership, um, although obviously, of course, would be expected to lead small teams and things. And I, I, I find it even with adventures, you know, I love going to do my adventures on my own or with my friends. But the moment someone says, will you lead an expedition? even though I'm often doing that anyway, but because somebody's coined it and bracketed it that you're now in charge, you know, it, it does, it puts the fear of, of the fear of death in me that because I'm now responsible for, for other people's lives, uh, you know, and I can only just keep myself alive half the time. Um, so 
it is. I, I think when, when, when you coin the phrase leader or leadership, even, even, and I'm being very honest, even to come on this podcast, you know, uh, Leader Connect, I, I, I do. I, I thought exactly what you just said about imposter syndrome when I was like, oh, do, do, do I want to be saying that I'm a leader to the world? Do I want to talk about it? Even though, you know, in, in many of the roles that I do, whether it's, you know, as a, as a patron of a charity or as an ambassador of an organization, of course, you're there because you're, you're a leader in some way, shape or form. But I always, I always do think of myself as, as, as perhaps an unlikely leader as well, because I just, I do things that I enjoy. I do things that I'm passionate about, that have purpose. And I try to take people on that, that same journey with me. And, you know, it, it, as, as Neil often says, it's, it, that, that's leadership in its purest form. <laughs> but although I wouldn't consider it uh, me being a leader, I'm just doing what I love and trying to have a positive impact on the world with, with my, as you say, clear, compelling purpose. Um, and I think that's the same for a lot of people. I don't think we're in the minority, uh, you know, unless you're the, the CEO or a managing director of an organization or, 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 or you know, or the person in charge of a, a military unit. You know, I, I think a lot of people don't consider themselves leaders, even though they are leading. What if leadership was just setting an example? Wouldn't that make things so much easier? Because we tend to, you, you know, you just said it, we, you, you, you're a leader if you've got the title CEO or commanding officer or managing director or whatever it is. But what if leadership was literally just going out there and setting an example for other people to follow? Wouldn't that just be so much better because that's what you're doing I think to a certain extent that's what I do I can see that that's what my six and a half year old is doing because she goes to school and we've given her a strong set of values and she's showing people how to to kind of follow her lead in 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 that respect absolutely and you know what maybe maybe that is leadership and maybe it's all the corporate jargon and everything else that we read and that that, that, that has mystified it but, you know often for commercial reasons but I think absolutely you know like you say your your child your your, your daughter they're going to school as a six-year-old and sharing you know important British values leading by example trying to do good and help others for me, that's 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 leadership in its purest form, and you know, I I salute and commend anyone that at any age. Yeah, hopefully we'll see how she gets on today. She she wasn't so cool about going to school today, but I promised her a McDonald's at the end of the day. So, <laughs> so life is incentivized leadership. <laughs> Absolutely. Um. So look, I'm going to do this bit in the middle now that I call the sandwich. It's a really bad name for for something that I haven't really come up for a, 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 with a better name for. Um. And it's I'm going to ask you some kind of really snaps maybe slightly daft questions. So bear with me. So my first question in the sandwich is. What frightens you? Oh, what frightens me? Um, I think, again, like a lot of people, um, I think the fear of failure, you know, doing, going to, going to do something or attempt to do something and, 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 and the fear that I might not get there or might not achieve whatever it is. I think that, that often fear, the, the fear of failure is quite prominent. I, th I think that's the same with a lot of military, ex-military personnel. I think often it's one of the things that drives you through. Uh, it's actually used as a great tool, um, to, to, as a self-motivating internal tool, um, whether that be for, I, I can remember being on courses as a, as a young sort of trooper, private soldier, and the, the fear of going from my unit to another unit on a course, the fear of failure would literally get me through it. It made me work harder <laughs> sometimes. So I think the fear of failure, you know, I, 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 I'm not really scared of, of, of many things. And I don't say that in a, in a sort of big macho way. I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm a risk manager by trade, you know, that's what, what I study and what I do. And so I, I, I think whatever the challenge is, you know, whether it be physical or psychological, it's about breaking down into milestones and analyzing what's achievable, what the risks are, what the likelihood is of, of doing something. So, yeah, I, I think the fear, fear of failure is probably the biggest one um, for me. Who inspires you? Oh, who inspires me? Lots of people inspire me. Um, and, and, and again, they're not they're not people who are household names. In fact, far from it. You know, I'm, I'm, I often find that the, the people in the public eye are quite uninspiring most of the time. Um, but, you know, and I, I, I'm not just saying it because I'm on your podcast, but people like yourselves, people in the Army Cadet Force, you know, the NHS, real life people who, who are doing what they do to an exceptional level, not because they want any kudos for it, not because they're, they're, they're looking for any awards, but because they're, they're absolutely committed to making a difference. I think... 
for me, they're they're the people who inspire me every day. Um, my 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 family, my dad. You know, he was a, a very inspiring person. He installed the values into in, into me that I still hold today. Um, I think in terms of adventurers as well. You know, the lots of people who are constantly pushing the boundaries. Again, not not necessarily household names, but uh, people uh, who are going above and beyond. Um, you know, I like like people like Craig Matheson um, with the Polar Academy. I think in, in, amazing, you know, again, maybe not somebody who, unless you're in the adventure world, you would, perhaps not a household name, but check him out because he's doing incredible things uh, for young people and people like that who, who are just going above and beyond on another level to, to make a difference. Um, have you made your bed this morning? I make my bed every morning. <laughs> First job of the day. Isn't it so important? I mean, it's the tiniest, tiniest thing. And the days that I haven't, and I go back up there at night and go, I haven't made that. It's just complete. It's it's about getting your mindset right at the, the front end of the day, isn't it? And that's a really, really important thing. Absolutely. And do you know what? My daughter, uh, when she stays here with me, she is very, uh, I, mean, I, I don't know if it's the military genes or something, but she will make a bed every time, as soon as she gets out of it. And she's even at the point where she picks me up. It, you know, if I, I might be in the bathroom still brushing my teeth and she will tell me that I've not made my bed, which is brilliant. <laughs> Oh, you've got that so sorted. We're a little way off that as you know, <laughs> our military child isn't quite there yet, but we will get there. Um, and then the, the one thing that I just wanted to know was um, if you could do the ultimate adventure, um, money, no object, danger, no object, you know, the world as it is, you could go anywhere, do anything. Um, what would it be? Oh, what a great, what a great question. Um I, I, I love to go into space. I think that would be incredible to go into space and, you know, to take, you know, a group of young people on a sort of once in a lifetime expedition to, you know, somewhere crazy like the moon or Mars or something and do something outrageous. But, you know, we, even at the moment, I would love to, I'm sort of trying to focus more over the next few years on, you know, taking young people on life changing experiences, a bit in, a bit in a similar fashion to what, what Craig's done with the Polar Academy, but, but on a more perhaps educational sort of STEM, you know, a science, technology, engineering, maths sort of expedition. It's something I've been working on recently, sort of behind the scenes. And I, I would love to, you know, take a, a team of cadets to row the Pacific or the Atlantic or do something that will change their life forever that, you know, and perhaps the youngest team that's ever done it or something like that. I would, I, th I think it, it, they would set an example to so many others about what you can achieve and what you could learn from, from adventure. I think... I think the world, you know, I, I spent a lot, of, a lot of time over the last six months looking at um, how, how people are engaged in schools and, and the, the rate of, of drop off in, in interest in key subjects at the moment is so high. And I think one of the reasons is because we've not, we've not moved on with sort of innovation, creativity in the classroom and in the education sector. And I'm, I'm really passionate about trying to bring adventure into schools um, so, so people can learn from it. When I, I was in Antarctica in December and I did, a, I did an assembly live from Antarctica to a bunch of children. And I just thought how incredible if, if we could do something like along this theme more often where we teach them about you know, the, the technology that I'm using, whether it be the satellite communications or you know, the, 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 the penguins that we're about to meet or the climate change issues, but, but from real firsthand experience, not from a an old science textbook from 30 years ago. And I, I just think there's a way that we can innovate with adventure into the school setting and learn so much from it. So I'm working on a bit of a project called Expedition STEM at the moment. And, and you know, and for me, I, one of my big dreams would be to take um, a group of young people on a, on a life changing STEM expedition. So we have um, a lot of head teachers and executive head teachers um, who listen to this podcast. So, so there we go. There's an idea. Um, if there's a school out there that would like to kind of take this and, and run with this, um, then all you need to do is, is reach out to us because Jordan is ready and waiting to take your kids on on an adventure that contextualizes uh, contextualizes education, which I think is is so so important. And um, you know, the only way we're going to save the world is by seeing how bad it's got. Um, and, and as you say, you know, we do our very best in schools with textbooks and, and going on the internet, but you've got to see it. You've got to be there in order to be able to make that change, haven't you? And I think that's really important. Um, so you are an absolutely fabulous communicator. Um, you know, you are amazing. I've seen you speaking before and, and putting your story across and, and doing what we're doing now. 
um, you are very, very good at, at, at telling your story um, and getting people to buy into it, to what it is that you're doing. Um, a lot of the people listening to this podcast really struggle with that notion of, of putting their their kind of ideas across verbally or in, in whatever way. And, and some of that is to do with that imposter syndrome as well, doing absolutely amazing things, but, but really struggling to kind of put themselves on the stage to, to talk about it. And I just wanted to tap into um, to, to how you have kind of developed the confidence to go out there and tell the world about what it is that you're, that you're doing. No, well, um, well, firstly, thank you for the very kind words. Uh, really appreciate them. But I think I think it's about purpose. I think it's about you know if you believe in what you're doing, then 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 don't be afraid to go and share that and tell the world. I think you know, especially if you know if you're in a position of leadership, you know you you you, you need to take people on this journey. You need to to lead by example and and and, and roadmap the way forward. So. You have to be confident in what you're doing. You have to be authentic as well. I think there's a lot to be said for authenticity. Um, I think, you know, be, be yourself. You know, don't try to be, don't try to, I, I, maybe this isn't good advice because I know other people would, 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 would disagree with this, but I don't try to, to, to model myself on other leaders. I, I, I try to be me and I try to do what I do. And sometimes that might not work for everybody. You know, you, you will always get detractors. You will always get a bit of negativity especially in the digital world, you'll get trolls who, who want to take you and pull you off track, you know, but you have to cut through that, no, that negative noise and you have to keep moving in the direction of travel that, that you want to go in. And if you've got a purpose and you truly believe in that purpose, whatever it might be, that is such a powerful thing. You know, I see a lot of people these days, they come to and ask me about uh, fundraising, you know, who should I fundraise for, which charity? And, and I say to them that I can't choose which charity you want to fundraise for. I can't really advise you because it's got to come from from within. It's got to come from you because if you, uh, 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 you know, are, are adventuring or running or going through some pain for a cause, you know, that is a very powerful thing if you believe in it. But if you don't believe in it and it's just another charity that, that you know, that you found online, it, it doesn't really mean anything to you. It's got to, it's got to mean something. Um, I think there's a big difference between success and fulfillment I think you've got to do things that fulfill you and you enjoy that, that you know I think a lot of leaders and a lot of my friends as well dare I say and including me I've experienced it you, you you judge success in leadership positions often by external factors you know contracts um, pay scales titles whereas you know great fulfillment comes from internal it comes internally it comes from what's inside you how does it make you feel um, I, I was working when I left the army. I was working at a very well-paid job in in the city in Mayfair, uh, and and I I I got I, I was going down a, a bad track actually. I was I started becoming obsessed with with very material things. You know what what car was I driving now? I was what what watch did I wear when I went into a meeting with a certain business or individual? And I, and I, and and I, I I really went into a quite a toxic environment I think in terms of you know I was sitting around with lots of managing directors CEOs and I felt like that I had to keep up with them and I wasn't being myself and, and actually you know I'm quite a simple person who lives a simple life I you know I, I don't need a lot to, to, to live but I was trying to collect all these things to justify why I was being this sitting at this table with all these leaders and I think you have to remain true to yourself and you have to be you I think that's really important um but, but find what your purpose is. And, and, and a lot of people can go through life without finding that. But it, when, when you find it, you will know that that's, that's what your role is. That's what your purpose is in life. And, and when, you, when, when that comes, that is so powerful to make a difference, not only for the people that you're leading, but also for you, you know, because that will give you the, the energy, the motivation to, to get out of bed in the morning and, and keep striving for whatever that objective is. Uh, and I think when you really want something bad enough, um, you know, that, that's what you do. Um, and I think accountability as well. I just touch on accountability. Um, you know, we have to be accountable as leaders, but also be accountable to yourself. You know, set yourself goals. Have a look in the mirror and 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 decide with you what you want to achieve in life. Um, before you, you, you've got to believe in something because if you don't, it's impossible to go and convince everyone who you're trying to lead to come with you. You know, if you don't believe it and it's not true to you, you you, you can't take people with you on that journey. You know, people will see through it quite quickly and quite early authentic leadership is so important and we do we hide behind who we think we should be and what the job title says and what the job description says but but you're so right you cannot get out of bed in the morning 
if you're doing something that you truly don't believe in. Um, and that's that, that that's the hardest thing in the world. So you've done something really interesting. And I understand that you're five months into a 12 month um, no social media um, thing. So so and I, I feel daft for saying this because how have we got in a world where I'm about to say, wow, that must be really hard. <laughs> but um, so why did that come about? How's it going? And and how has it changed your life? Yeah, so on um, last year, 2021, the 10th of October, um, World Mental Health Day, I decided that I was going to take a break uh, for at least a year. Uh, and for lots of different reasons, really. One, the first one was I, 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 I was addicted to social media. I was spending more time on there than I was in, in with my family, with my work or whatever it might be. And I, I, I just felt I was in this, I was in this sort of, I think I've coined it a scroll hole now where I would just literally sit on the phone for hours on end at night, you know, the TV might be on or whatever, life's going on in the background. And I'd just be scrolling and refreshing. And I, I found it really addictive. Alongside that, I found with what's going on in the world, you know, with COVID, with Ukraine, there's so much negativity out there. Um, everything was a constant negative news feed into my, you know, so that was part of it. I think I, I, I came to learn of quite a few tragic incidents involving young people committing suicide as a result of trolling of online bullying and also i've been i've been a victim of those things as well i think the more profile you build unfortunately the more you become a target in in the social digital world you know people whether it's you know just want to pull you down or it's jealousy or envy or whatever it might be um now and again you know people want to have a pop at you and i'm i find that quite difficult you know i i, I can get a thousand good positive comments but i get one negative and i find that quite difficult you know I'll, I'll i'll think about that for a week to be quite honest um and i'm thinking what have i ever done to upset someone why would they why would they ever uh, target me with with a bit of trolling or whatever and so i found that quite tough um and also it was disrupting my family life. You know, when my daughter saying to me, daddy, can we go to the park? You're on your phone. Let's just go outside. I thought I need to do something. It's becoming a, a real problem. And <clears throat> I came across five different cases of suicide be, of, of, of young people between the ages of 12 and 17 over the last 12 months. And I've had the I, a privilege is a pleasure, maybe the wrong word, but I've, I've had the insight to speak to their parents and, and, and to understand. And I've tried to learn about what their child was going through. And a lot of the things that we see as, as normal now on social media is, 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 are the problems and challenges that young people face. And we live in a, for young people, I think it's very difficult. I think they have a tough time because we live in a, a comparison culture now where children don't feel good enough in their own skin. You know, they, they have to filter every photo that goes online because, they, you know, even, even my own daughter, it, it horrifies me. She'll, she'll be worried about her skin or something. And she's, she's 12 years old, she's 13, she's going through puberty and yet she will have to put five or six filters on a TikTok before it's, you know, or whatever it might be. And it, it, it actually cuts me deep. It saddens me that, that we live in this type of world now where people can't be themselves. We have to be portrayed to be something we're not or somebody else. And, and it's an easy trap to get caught into as well, I, I think. And I realized I was in an assembly um, back in September, October in Hampshire, and I, I did a talk with about 600 children. And just before we started, two things happened in this assembly. One, before the assembly started, um, a child, I was asking the children at the, in the front row before the teacher, the head teacher came. And I said to the, the children, oh, I was just making general chit chat. What, what do you want to be when you're older? And the children's answers, I was quite astonished by because the children's answers all were along the lines of being famous, being an influencer, being a celebrity, uh, being a, a YouTuber one, being an Instagram model, um, being a gamer and all these things that for me, I just thought, wow, that is that is incredible because what happened to being a nurse, a doctor, a scientist, a, an inventor, an explorer, a creator, an engineer. And, and, I, and when I go into schools now these days, I, I often ask this question as well when I'm making general chat. And, and I'm not talking about a minority of young people. I'm talking about 60 to 80 percent that's that's the things that I'm hearing you know and that and, and I can see the the look on teachers faces when they're hearing you know I'm coming in as a guest and and, and their students are telling me and, and 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 teachers are horrified as well I see it myself and when I when I you know things like a YouTuber is quite an interesting one I was talking to a student the other day and 
you know, it's, they want to sit online all day and, 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 and make videos, but I think we have to educate them on that. You know, let's talk about filmmaking. Let's talk about production. Let's talk about, you know, podcasting and things like, let's talk about things that have real substance to them, not just sitting on a YouTube channel all day. Let's break that down into, into which sort of STEM career path that goes into, you know, because things like film and media is, is a very interesting career, but let's, let, we need to educate children about the use of, of social media and new careers and things. But so, so that was the first thing. But then at the end of that assembly, I, I was asking for questions and, and people were putting their hands up. And one young boy, he was about 14, he puts his hand up and he says, and I, I just told him my journey of, of sort of being a soldier and uh, doing some charity work and adventures and expeditions. And he said to me, he said, he said, sir, he said, I just want to say that I hope I grow up to be like you when I'm older. And I said to him in front of the, the, the sort of audience, I said, well, that's an incredibly kind thing to say, but why, why do you say that? And, and I assumed that he was going to talk about, you know, serving my country or, or building a school in Africa or something. And the answer, what he said, horrified me. He said, I've just checked you out and you've got over 100,000 followers on Instagram and you've got a blue tick next to your name. And it was at that point when I was driving home that day, I said, I said to myself, I, I need to, I need to do something. I need to take a break from this because I also felt that I was part of the problem. You know, these, these, and I don't like the term influencer or, or whatever people want to call it, but for whatever reasons, people have, have, have taken an interest in my journey and they follow me. And I think that comes with a lot of responsibility. If I've got lots of young people following my journey, I think I have to be accountable to them. I have a responsibility to, to them. And I realized that I was traveling around the world, very privileged and very fortunate to be sponsored to go and travel around the world and do adventures and things. And actually, if I looked at my Instagram and I did that day, it was all these amazing pictures from the Himalayas to Antarctica. And people, people see that and they think that that's my life. And, and one that does sometimes create a bit of negativity because there's a bit of jealousy. And also it makes people believe that that is my life every day, which is far from my life. You know, I was an hour ago, I, I still got oil on my hands. I was changing a tire down off the, off the A303 and I'm not posting that on social media. You know, I, I have the same challenges that everyone else has, but what social media does is it allows us to post our best bits and almost like a showreel of our life. And it's, it's about a 5% at best reflection of our actual life. And I realized that I, I was part of that problem, you know, because I was posting these things and people thought that, that I was living the dream, which, you know, I, I have the same stresses as everyone else and the same problems. And so I, I realized that I wanted to be more authentic to the people that were following me because I realized I wasn't, it wasn't, I was portraying a life that perhaps wasn't, that I wasn't living um, in some respects. And I realized that a lot of these so-called influencers, they, they, they're so focused on selling the latest tanning product or discount code or whatever it might be that it's 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 so uninspiring in so many ways and and i i don't know what the answer is to this but for me i'm gonna i spent a year trying to talk about this in school so a lot of schools i'm talking about at the moment the challenges of social media the reality of social media the comparison culture the scroll holes and all these other terms that i've coined to speak to children about and and it's quite interesting because they they seem to be quite engage with what I'm saying because I think when you're saying it as someone who does have a profile and you know for, for me it's quite a big thing to shut down my social media because a lot of opportunities came from social media so I'm learning a lot along the way as well um, so it's it's fascinating and what I'm doing is I've documented the whole process and the lessons I've learned over the last I'm, I'm six or seven months into my 12 months now and I've been making a short documentary uh, with a film produce uh, production company and I've spoke to people who have really been affected by suicides through social media. So I've spoke to parents uh, who have lost their children through social media bullying. I've, I've spoke to children uh, with their parents' approval who are being bullied and have come through the other side. I've even spoke to, believe it or not, a troll, a rehabilitated troll who, 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 was, who was explained why they troll people, who, who, what, what, you know, what, what were they going through that, that, that they thought that was acceptable. And and so, so we've, we've, I've, I've got a lot of interesting content and the irony is that I'll have to share this on social media at the end of it all. <laughs> yes, yeah, you, you will. And I, I think that, you know, I mean, it, it terrifies me as, as a parent, but particularly as a parent of a girl as well. And, and I'd like to say that I think some of it is, is 
um, me kind of empowering her at home and understanding, you know, that she's got the most beautiful red hair. And I know that at some point in her life, somebody will have a go at her be because of that. Um, and some of it's that foundational work. But I do understand equally as a parent, you know, you can't, you can do everything you possibly can do. But the influence, the outside influences that come in on the phone or the iPad are so, so strong. Um, social media is an incredible tool for getting messages across, um, positive messages. And as, as you know, you know, spreading the word about some of the amazing things that you've been doing. Um, but also we need to be really, really mindful about how we use it. And that needs to be taught in schools. And I'm sure that the documentary is going to go a long way to kind of helping people understand the reality of that. I think just, just to say on that final uh, point, um, Sarah, because it's, it's, it's really important for me as well, um, this subject, I think one of the, the common themes what I've, I've come across over the last six months from speaking to parents and teachers especially is, is, the, is the bullying aspect or the trolling or whatever you, whatever you want to call it is it, the difference between the past and now is when as a child especially is when, when you left school, for example, I'm not suggesting people get bullied in school, it could be outside school, but for example, you leave school, the moment you walk in your front door, that should be a safe space. You know, whatever's happened, when you're at home, you should be safe with your family. In your, uh, and what, what I'm seeing a lot of is people are being bullied in their bedrooms via things like social media. And the parents, the teachers, they don't even have a clue this is happening. And, uh, you know, there's, there's been a, quite a few cases that have led to tragic circumstances what, that I've been going interviewing parents. And, and one of the, the common themes of, of these really tragic circumstances is the parents say to me that they didn't even know it was happening. And, you know, so when you can be bullied while lying in your own bed, something has to be done about that. So there's got to be, whether it's the law, the legal or the, the social media companies, something's got to be done about that from an accountability. It's not acceptable. No, I, I completely agree. You know, grow, I, was, I went to school in the 90s and, you know, you'd have an argument with your mate at school, come home. You, you didn't have any contact with them. You'd go back the next day. It was all fine. But, but as you say, yeah, you know, th this is happening outside of school and in that safe space and yeah I mean I let, let's see let's see what happens but um like I say you know I think it's um we need to we need to do a lot um to 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 change the the impact of social media if we can so what I just wanted to do is we'll draw this to a close now because I could talk about all of this stuff for a very very long time um but it's getting really hot in my shed where I'm <laughs> recording from so um so um hunted is uh it's, it's on the telly at the moment although I think it might have finished a couple of nights ago but I'm guessing people can go on and binge watch it if they want to <laughs> yeah absolutely uh celebrity hunted uh, which was in, in aid of an important cause, Stand Up For Cancer. Uh, that has just finished episode six, I think, last Sunday, which was the final episode. Um, I, won't, I won't spoil what happened, but you can watch it on all four, binge watch it. And we did film another season last year, which will come out in the next few months, I, I, I believe, which is the main series. And we've just been commissioned to do two more series. So lots more Hunted to come if, if you're a fan of Hunted. <laughs> I love how we've made hide and seek into a really successful <laughs> show. I love it. I love that concept. And um, The Power of the Paddle, which is your latest book, Sunday Times bestseller, is out now and people can buy that. I've read it this week. It's definitely worth reading um, because whilst we were all binge watching stuff on Netflix during lockdown, you were doing something absolutely insane um, and 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 just brilliant. Um, so thank you for that. And then also we'll, we'll await your re-emergence onto social media um, in a really, really positive way. But I, I can't wait to see that documentary as well. So do keep in touch and let us know when that's going to be out, because I know there will be a lot of people listening to this podcast now that will want to watch that and, and equally probably um, show it to their pupils or people in their teams or whatever it is. Jordan Wiley, thank you so, so much for being part of the Leader Connect podcast. No, thank you so much for, for having me. Real pleasure. Thank you.